Hello and welcome to the Explain series with our host, Dr. Brett Palmer. In this episode, we're going to be talking about herpes, or everything you didn't want to know about herpes, but have been forced to find out. So what exactly is herpes? Well, herpes is caused by the herpes simplex uh, virus, uh, and uh, otherwise known as just HSV. And it comes from a family of uh, viruses known as human herpes viruses, or HHV. Uh, all of the human herpes viruses are lifelong. And you've heard uh, many of them anyway. So um, uh, HSV1 is known as the cold sore virus and typically sticks around the mouth. HSV2 is the genital cold sore virus or genital herpes virus and sticks around the genitals. Um, uh, uh, human herpes virus number three, you've heard, that's chickenpox. Uh, and, you can, uh, and chickenpox uh, you can catch. And then uh, unlike herpes, which outbreaks every few uh, weeks or months if you're unlucky, uh, chickenpox outbreaks uh, every few decades uh, or maybe uh, once in your uh, 60s or 70s. Um, HHV4 is the Epsom Barr virus known as glandular fever. Uh, five is a cytomegalovirus. Doesn't matter if you haven't heard of it. Six and seven I'll skip over um, because no one really's heard of them anyway. And HHV8 is called the um, uh, Carposis sarcoma herpes virus, otherwise known as uh, KSHV, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and I've done a, an episode on Carposis sarcoma and also Castleman's disease because it's um, HHV8 is it's actually linked to that as well. So um, going back to uh, good old fashioned herpes, which is HHV8, uh, sorry, HHV1 and 2. But in this episode, I'm just going to continue calling them HSV type 1 or HSV type 2. Now, regardless of type, if it's around the mouth, it's called oral herpes uh, or if you prefer cold sores. If you've got herpes or um, ulcers around the genitals, it's called genital herpes or if you prefer genital herpes. Uh, cold sores and that is effectively it. It doesn't really matter uh, what type you've got. Uh, however, uh, if you're interested, type 1 does prefer to be around the oral uh, mouth side and type 2 does prefer to be around the genital side. But due to oral sex, you can have them in either place and you can have both in the same place as well. And type 1 is slightly protected of type 2 because quite a few people actually have both types at the same time. So how common is herpes? Well, if you take 100 people 50 years or older, then 90% of them will have herpes. 90%? Jesus, isn't that a little bit high? Well, that's the way it is because uh, herpes simplex virus is a human herpes virus. It's very, very common for humans to get viruses for humans. That's the whole point of um, HHV8, uh, sorry, HHV uh, viruses. They're very, very common. And so by the time you reach 50 years of age, 90% of 50-year-old people or older will have herpes. It's as simple as that. So how do you catch it? Well, it's passed from person to person by direct skin to skin contact. So HSV1 is usually caught when you're a child. You know, Aunt May coming to change the baby. Um, you know, she's a 60 year old woman with a big cold sore and she changes the baby because she doesn't give uh, two hoots anymore that she's got a cold sore. And she'll go kuchi kuchi ku. Uh, and uh, there you go. The baby has now got HSV1. It's as simple as that. Uh, HSV2 um, uh, is generally caught when you're sexually active. Or to put it another way, oral cold sores, um, uh, oral herpes is caught as a kid. Gentle cold sores or gentle herpes, regardless of type, is caught when you're sexually active. It's probably a, uh, a better way of saying it. And as I said before, you can catch either or both in any, any area. Now, transmission can occur uh, if a sore is present, but transmission can also occur if there's no sore, um, and, but the person is only shedding the virus. And this is called asymptomatic shedding. Uh, the most common places for infection are the mouth, known as cold sores, followed by uh, the genital area and also by uh, the hands. And most people are generally only infected in one area and they're unlikely to transfer it to other parts of the body. But I'll come on to that in a moment. Now, there is a form of herpes um, uh, that wrestlers can get, and that's called herpes gladiatorium or sometimes just called mat herpes and that can be anywhere on the head and anywhere generally on the body. 
So where does herpes live? Well, herpes lives in something called uh, dorsal root ganglion, or uh, if you prefer, sensory neuron cell body in the peripheral nervous system. So this is a bit of a technical stuff. Uh, in short, it lives in your nerves, but it doesn't live in your central nervous system. It lives in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so that's everything outside the brain and spinal column. Uh, and it lives there quite happily, exactly the same as uh, chickenpox virus, the VZV virus. And occasionally it will come out, uh, go up to the uh, skin um, uh, uh, and shed uh, and be passed on. Uh, and then it will go uh, back down again. Uh, for some people, it sticks around a bit longer and it can cause blisters. And this purely depends on whether you get blisters or not. It depends on your own personal immune response. Some people have a very good immune response and can hold back the blistering process. Others can't. Uh, so what are the symptoms of uh, herpes? Well, uh, after infection, uh, this can be followed by symptoms such as um, sores and these sores, um, uh, also tend you get blisters and these blisters then break down into sores, which can be very, very painful. Um, and uh, this first outbreak can be followed by a second outbreak a few weeks or months later. But some people won't get a second outbreak or even their first outbreak for years, sometimes decades. A lot of the time um, in my clinic, I may have a, a 50 or 60 year old woman come up to me and says, my husband or my other half has been unfaithful to me. And I'll say, well, you know, not necessarily if there's trust issues in your relationship, that's a different kettle of fish. Um, but uh, what could happen is you could have caught herpes when you were uh, much younger, even before uh, 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 this current relationship. And only now has herpes come out because your immune system has started to drop down. Uh, and that is their first outbreak. Um, you could argue uh, what is the natural course or the expected course in the medical literature. Uh, catch herpes on day one, uh, and you uh, a few days after that, you start to feel as if you've got a fluey illness. Your lymph nodes in your groin uh, are up. If you catch cold sores, uh, your lymph nodes around your neck uh, could be raised. You feel, you feel generally fluey, tired, uh, a little bit uh, uh, fed up with everything. Um, and uh, a few days after that, or seven days after you caught it, you may get some um, uh, blisters come up and they break down into sores. And five to seven to ten days afterwards, um, it, it tends to go away. And that traditionally is what happens. Some people get it much, much worse. Some people obviously uh, don't get any symptoms uh, whatsoever. And a lot of the time, herpes is just a short-lived redness uh, of the skin. And most of the time, it's not even noticed. Uh, sometimes a first infection can make a person feel very unwell, um, and other times, no problem at all. And you have to remember, you can get blisters in the mouth, lips, genitals, and also elsewhere on the skin uh, as well. Uh, so, um, the, uh, as I said, you can get uh, uh, pink uh, bumps and small blisters, uh, but when they when the blisters or the uh, the sores start to crust over, uh, the pain tends to go away and uh, healing generally takes a few days. And usually scarring is not left with herpes the majority of the time. Uh, obviously, uh, when herpes is in a particularly sensitive place, for example, the eye, it can cause pain, discharge, sensitivity to light and can cause uh, actual scarring. And you don't want scarring because that's your eyesight. So if you do have herpes and it's encroaching onto the eyeball, uh, then you need to go and see um, uh, an eye doctor or go to an eye hospital uh, as quickly as possible in order to get uh, that treatment. So what does herpes look like? So here's um, uh, a few uh, uh, pictures. Uh, uh, you can get online from uh, uh, Dreams Time. I'm not advertising them. I'm just saying that uh, 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 these are uh, freely available uh, photos. Um, and uh, you can see here on the, you can get it on the thumb. Uh, you can get it by the nail as well, which is uh, like a Whitlow. You can get it around the mouth. These are cold sores and also around the nose. And then uh, there's a generic photo or you can get sores anywhere on the skin, on the genitals, etc. It tends to look the same wherever it is. So um, herpes remains uh, dormant um, and close to the uh, original infection. And when it gets uh, reactivated, um, 
you know, the virus travels to the skin and you get these uh, blisters and ten, you tend to get it uh, from the same uh, place uh, every time uh, the uh, outbreak uh, or the reoccurrence uh, occurs. It doesn't travel around and one day it's uh, on your belly button, another day it's on your butt, another day it's on your knee. It tends to, where, where it went into the body, it tends to stick around as a general uh, rule for the vast majority of people. Um, uh, how, how is it diagnosed? Uh, well, any clinician uh, experienced in diagnosing and treating herpes can just look at that and say, oh, that's herpes. However, no clinician can look at herpes and say, that's definitely type 1 or that's definitely type 2 uh, or some other form of uh, blistering rash. Not by looking at it, no. You need something called a PCR swab. And that should be taken of the blister or the ulcer. And yes, that will be painful, unfortunately, but it will tell you, uh, well, it will confirm whether it is actually herpes or not, um, because it's important to remember uh, that um, uh, blisters around a particular sensitive area uh, doesn't have to be herpes. It can also be um, uh, shingles. And so around about two to five percent of all people diagnosed with herpes, actually, it's genital shingles and it's not herpes. Uh, at all. It doesn't mean you don't have herpes, it just means they were misdiagnosed um, at that particular time. And so a PCR swab is important to confirm that it's herpes. Does it really matter if you've got type 1 or type 2? Well, as I said, type 2 tends to be a little bit more aggressive uh, compared to type 1. So it's like um, uh, type 1 being a red Ferrari and type 2 being a yellow Ferrari. They're both Ferraris, they're both exactly the same, uh, but the yellow ones are probably a little bit more noticeable uh, than the red ones. Um, and it's the same with um, uh, herpes, HSV2 being the yellow Ferrari, uh, and uh, generally if it's on the uh, genitals, it tends to be a little bit more aggressive, so a little bit more noticeable uh, than HSV1. But the treatment is the same regardless of type. So what about blood tests? Well, 90% of the population are going to end up with herpes, so why bother? Why are we trying to pathologise something being normal? A lot of private clinics do actually... Um, uh, do blood tests for herpes and um, because it's a great way of bringing patients back oh you've got herpes you need to come back for another blood test in six months it's just a money spinner because they're not going to do anything with that result and that's poor medicine and uh, and why do you want to know if you've definitely got herpes or not or is it going to mean if, if you do have herpes you're never going to form a sexual relationship with another human being again or if you don't her have herpes but your partner does what you're going to dump them yeah that's really cool it's only cold sores at the end of the day. What is the point of having a, bl um, a blood test? Now, in some specific situations, uh, a blood test is very useful. So I do research and so I take, uh, I do do herpes blood tests because it's important for the research because I need a solid marker. And blood tests are important uh, if uh, people are pregnant. Uh, but if there is a lot of angst and anxiety um, within a relationship, um, sometimes uh, we can do uh, blood tests as well. But for a general screening test to see whether you've got it or not, no. You have to remember the blood tests are not 100% anyway, uh, and they're about about 85% uh, specific to the virus, uh, to the, um, uh, sorry, the, t the test is around about 85% accurate uh, because the antibody to HSV uh, is not always there and can be a little bit unstable. So you can actually have a negative antibody uh, and um, uh, but still have uh, herpes. So it's quite important to realise uh, that it's not going to be the panacea um, to answer all your questions. And it will certainly not, under any circumstance, tell you when you got uh, infected, uh, especially if you've got a long-term infection. Who knows um, which partner in the past uh, gave you herpes. So what is the treatment of herpes? Salt water baths, analgesia tablets, which I tend not to recommend. I prefer topical analgesia like lidocaine gel. Uh, it stings for about 15-20 uh, seconds when you put it on, uh, but then it goes a uh, numb. It's not a sex lube, it's uh, analgesia, so only just put a little bit on. And also antiviral drugs, which I'll come on to in a moment. In fact, now. So the treatment for herpes, acyclovir, valacyclovir and famcyclovir all reduce the verity and duration of the episodes full stop. Antiviral therapy does not alter the natural history 
uh, of the disease or the frequency or severity of subsequent reoccurrences. Okay, so in other words, you take acyclovir one go, it's not going to make any difference to when, where and um, how uh, herpes breaks, or breaks out in the future. And uh, uh, acyclovir, which is medicine usually give out, is very, very good when you um, first get uh, herpes or you first get the, sim the first signs of herpes but when you uh, or herpes outbreak but if you uh, leave it too long then it's probably not going to make that much of a difference so if your natural outbreak cycle is for example 10 days and you take it on day one on the first symptoms you will probably shorten it down uh, quite uh, by quite a lot if however you wait until day five it's probably not going to make much of a difference anyway so here are some of the uh, treatment regimes. I tend to prefer acyclovir 400 milligrams three times a day because acyclovir is a very, very uh, good medication. Uh, that is its active form. Some people can get a little bit sicky with it, in which case then you can give them valcyclovir 500 milligrams twice a day. Now valcyclovir is exactly the same as acyclovir, but it's inactivated. So you have to swallow it, it has to be absorbed, and then goes through the liver and the valve bit gets knocked off and then you get acyclovir, which is the effective part of it. Uh, you have uh, the alternative regimes, 200 milligrams five times a day uh, for a cycle. Of, why would the hell would you give you five, uh, 200 milligrams five times a day? You're going to forget it. Uh, <laughs> you, you won't know by the end of the day whether you're taking three, four or five uh, tablets. What's the point? Uh, so if you're going to give a cycle of it, always give three times a day. Uh, fam cycle of it, uh, 253 times a day can be given, but why bother giving it? Because it's about 20 times more expensive than acyclovir, and acyclovir is uh, a fantastic drug uh, with very low side effect profile. Uh, so what are the complications of herpes? Well, some people uh, can get, when I say this is the most common, it doesn't mean it is common, but out of all the uh, complications of herpes that I tend to see, urine retention is by far the most. And it's not because of the herpes per se, uh, stopping you from being able to pee. Uh, where does herpes live? Herpes lives in the nerve cell and the nerve is being triggered and fired off, which is contracting the muscle. So no amount of giving extra acyclovir is going to help. And so what you can do if you've got mild urine retention is put salt in the bath, sit in the bath and try and pee in the bath. That's what some people do. But if you really can't pee, you need to go to hospital and they need to give you a catheter, either the traditional route or through... Um, uh, a superpubic uh, catheter. Now, it can be um, uh, very, very difficult and a little bit uh, frightening, but trust me, if you can't pee at all, you need to go to the emergency department and get your pee sorted out. Uh, it's very, very important. Increasing the doses of acyclovir will make no difference whatsoever. Um, you can get obviously severe constitutional symptoms, especially with first infection, headache, uh, uh, lots of pain, especially in the gentle area. If you've caught gentle herpes, um, uh, loss of appetite, tiredness, uh, just general viral symptoms. Uh, and obviously, uh, if you've got it uh, disseminated, it can cause uh, meningism uh, as well. Uh, in terms of recurrent um, herpes, what do I usually advise for that? Uh, saline bathing, uh, you can use a little bit of Vaseline um, and uh, I tend to say um, a lidocaine topical uh, gel tends to be quite good. If it gets worse and you need antiviral uh, therapy. But the vast majority of recurrent herpes aren't that bad and so don't bother hitting uh, tablets every time if it's if you can live with it. Okay, It's better to save those tablets just in case it gets really, really bad. Uh, for those people who do get bad recurrent herpes, then short course therapies are available. So acyclovir, 800 milligrams, so double the dose three times a day for two days, or uh, valcyclovir, 500 milligrams twice a day for three days. And alternatively, you can use the same uh, five-day treatments you use for a general uh, outbreak. Now, suppressive therapy uh, for people who have lots of outbreaks, getting one, uh, one every uh, month or every two months, so about six a year, uh, can consider suppressive therapy. But there are advantages and disadvantages. So the, the burden of taking daily treatment uh, compared to the, the burden of getting yet another outbreak. Uh, uh, the cost uh, of uh, the, the tablets uh, in the UK, you might be able to get them uh, for three through a sexual health service, but some sexual health service do not deal with uh, suppressive antiviral therapy for herpes. They uh, tell you to go to the GP for that prescription. May cost a bit of money. If you're elsewhere in America, uh, your insurance may not cover it. And so it may also um, 
uh, uh, cost again. There's also pressure on the kidneys as well. So if you're taking other tablets that affect the kidneys, it may knock off your kidney function a bit. So it's very important to um, think about it and think on the pros and cons. Uh, while, I, while I talk about pressure on the kidneys, it's still a very, very safe drug uh, to take. Okay, um, Obviously, some people uh, have got quite a lot of psychological anxiety around sex because of herpes, and it even destroys many relationships because of the uh, stigma they put on themselves. And if that's the case, then sometimes suppressive therapy uh, can also be uh, advisable. And suppressive therapy is the same drugs we've talked about, but uh, a slightly uh, lesser dose. Acyclovir, for example, 400 milligrams twice a day, or valcyclovir, 500 milligrams once a day. But if you are going to do suppressive therapy, take your drugs on time, um, because if you start missing doses, your uh, herpes can become resistant to drugs, which means it's very, very difficult to treat after that. So there's a few things before we come to herpes in pregnancy and research. Uh, so you can get hypertrophic herpes. And this is common in people who are immunosuppressed. Um, and that's where you get an overgrowth of the herpes lesion. And to be honest with you, it looks like cancer, but it's not. It's herpes. Um, and there, it's very, very rare. I've only ever seen it in HIV um, immunosuppressed patients who are being diagnosed for the first time and their immune system is, has been trashed. Uh, obviously, they're started on HIV therapy um, and uh, they get much, much better. And they also take uh, acyclovir and they get much, much better as well. And the hypertrophic herpes uh, tends to uh, melt away a bit. You can also get uh, proctitis. Uh, so that's uh, <laughs> literally a pain in the butt uh, and can be uh, caused by HSV. Uh, can be caused in immunocompromised, but it can also be caused in people who have a very good immune system and are not transplant patients or don't have HIV or anything else like that. So it is worth doing a viral swab uh, for HSV just to rule that out. Proctitis can also be caused by chlamydia, gonorrhea and syphilis as well. Um, so what are the psychological impacts of herpes? Depression, anger, uh, a lowering of your self-esteem and also hostility towards people who you think may have given it to you, although that can never be proven. Um, and that is, uh, these emotional problems tend to be carried heavier in women uh, than in men. And it's important to don't beat yourself up for it. It is only cold sores. Uh, I know it's easy to say. Um, um, so, so what do you tell your partner? Um, you know, if you've, if you've got herpes. Well, disclosure is very, very difficult, but I tend to encourage it wherever possible. Um, uh, you know, there are legal responsibilities for passing on an infection, even though 90% of the population have it and your partner probably has it anyway. Um, but it's always better to tell a partner um, and uh, tell new partners that you um, have herpes. But obviously on your first day, you're not going to say, oh, by the way, I've got gentle herpes. Uh, still fancy a drink? You're not going to say that, obviously, but when you get to know a person, date them for a few times and then eventually uh, you can say, oh, just to let you know, I do have I've had cold sores in the past. Does that put you off? And they may turn around and say, yeah, I've got cold sores as well. I'm not bothered about it um, or whatever the reaction is. If they overreact and run, um, uh, run a mile, then obviously um, they're not going to be uh, great for sticking around when uh, the shit hits the fan. If there's another problem, like if uh, cancer comes along. So in that respect, if they can't be bothered to stick around because they're frightened of cold sores, you're probably best shot of them anyway. Um, but if you are going to tell them, it's always better to tell someone before you have sex than if you're going to tell them uh, after sex, because that is deemed to be a little bit, um, to put it beyond you, a little bit unfair. Um, so um, that's what you, uh, that's what I tend to advise when you're telling a, a partner. Um, People which are really anxious can also be uh, referred to um, uh, the Herpes Association for uh, extra uh, advice. And there's a Herpes Association in the UK. There's also a Herpes Association in uh, America. Uh, and this is uh, these are really good organisations uh, to get to know to uh, to get to know. Uh, and so you know, join up, uh, get to know other people who have got herpes, and talk about it. Um, herpes is really common. It's actually a bit abnormal if you don't have herpes, is uh, if the truth be known. Um, and, and so uh, get in contact with uh, your local herpes virus association. Uh, if there is one in your country, there's not one in every country, but um, uh, but get on the internet. Uh, but to a certain extent, you could argue that's what is there. So generally, what do you do if you um, need to tell your partner? Well, 
During an outbreak, you don't share towels, don't share toilet products like toothbrushes. I mean, basic dental hygiene says you shouldn't be sharing toothbrushes anyway. Um, and uh, so, but obviously with an outbreak, don't share towels. Um, auto inoculation is very, very rare. Uh, so when you first catch herpes, your uh, immune system hasn't learned to deal with it. And so technically you can pass it uh, from one area of the body to another area of the body. Uh, and so that's called auto inoculation, but otherwise it is very, very rare. Uh, if you've got a, a skin problem that can happen, and, and sometimes uh, eye infections are a source of, you know, so people have been playing with their mouth and then they touch their eyes and, it, and they've, it's their first infection, for example, or they have um, uh, a skin problem. And so technically it can be done, uh, but it is generally very, very rare. Obviously, if you've got sores, stay away from sex, but why would you feel like sex if you've got sores anyway? And one thing that's also important to tell any partner, transmission may occur and probably will occur if it hasn't already um, due to asymptomatic uh, shedding. Okay, uh, and obviously people can also be taught um, uh, uh, to feel um, that it, when they're getting a particular outbreak, uh, to um, uh, take the various medications uh, when needed if they need to take a viral suppressive medication. Okay, um, uh, condoms can reduce uh, transmission, and I'll come on to that later. Uh, uh, reinfection is uh, impossible, uh, not impossible, but highly, uh, highly unlikely. And um, uh, the rates of transmission for condom use generally uh, it is around about um, uh, 20 to 50 percent uh, reduction. So here's some stats from women to men. You go from 1.7 transmissions per thousand to 0.6. You just think, hey, that's a very small reduction. And yeah, when you look at the absolute figures, that is a small reduction. But uh, 0.6 uh, is a uh, from 1.7 is a reduction of around about 65%. Uh, so it does uh, reduce. And from men to women, the reduction looks a lot bigger. It's um, 28 down to 1.3 per 1,000 uh, protected sex acts. And so that's uh, a reduction of around about uh, 90%. And so it is worth uh, considering uh, using uh, condoms. But you also have asymptomatic uh, spread as well. So uh, one thing is also to realise is, well, hang a minute, um, if um, does shedding occur during the day, during the night, when do I know when shedding is going to occur? You don't know when shedding is going to occur. It varies throughout the day. Um, and but the majority of shedding episodes are less than 12 hours. But unfortunately, you don't know when they are. And most of them will be asymptomatic. And even if you do take suppression therapy, for example, well, acyclovir, uh, it will only reduce transmission uh, by 50 percent. But if you use condoms as well, uh, that may be even uh, greater. So this is a link to herpes in pregnancy, uh, and I recommend uh, this link to anyone. Uh, if you don't want to read a whole guideline, I understand, uh, but the very last um, page is an algorithm, and in that algorithm, which I'll go through now uh, very, very quickly, is um, uh, basically a summary of all the guidelines. Now, if uh, the woman knows she's got herpes um, even before she gets pregnant, then you just treat any other uh, outbreak uh, as normal, or even if you catch herpes in the first uh, uh, trimester or so, uh, or even the second trimester, you can treat every other outbreak uh, with acyclovir. Uh, and then when you're 36 weeks into your 40-week uh, uh, pregnancy, you just go on uh, suppression therapy. And in pregnant women, it's 400 milligrams three times a day. Uh, and you just keep on taking it and then you can do um, a vagina delivery or if you want a, ces a cesarean. Now if you catch uh, herpes in your third trimester um, that's where it gets a little bit uh, tricky and then you should really go on suppression therapy uh, again um, may even go in a little bit sooner. Uh, now suppression therapy or acyclovir uh, 400 milligrams is an unlicensed medication but it's a good medication and we advise people uh, to take this medication. It's uh, fairly uh, safe, it's been used since the 1960s with uh, no serious adverse effects during pregnancy. Um, now, uh, some people uh, can go to vaginal delivery. Uh, some people uh, will be advised to go to the cesarean section. Any doubts, and if you're not bothered by cesarean section, then just go for cesarean section uh, if you're comfortable with that, and especially if the herpes is controlled. Now, here you will get a blood test to find out if you have IgG or IgM antibodies. IgG is a long-term antibodies, which means you've had the infection for quite some time. And that means you're passing those antibodies on to baby. 
IgM means you've had it very, very short. They're temporary antibodies, which means you'll only have, um, uh, you probably won't pass these antibodies on uh, enough to baby. And so a neonatal herpes then becomes a, a risk. Okay, and if it is a new infection, baby will get some acyclovir. Uh, and if they're unwell, unfortunately, they will need a, a lumbar puncture to see if they can pick up any, acyclo um, any HSV uh, infection. And with neonatal herpes, unfortunately, as you can see here, it can uh, be a little bit nasty with a mortality uh, from local uh, CNS disease of around 6%. Uh, and that can leave some kind of uh, neurological deficit or morbidity uh, uh, up to 70%. And for disseminated um, neonatal herpes, uh, the mortality rate is up to 30%, which is actually very high, uh, and even with uh, treatment. Um, and again, um, uh, the kids that survive can be left with a long-term uh, neurological uh, problem, unfortunately. And so this is uh, serious stuff. So for the prognosis of herpes, majority of people, it's only cold sores. Most infections will come uh, asymptomatic and it is really unnatural not to carry the herpes virus in some form. Um, and so there's lots of research happening around the world and for, for decades uh, there's been loads and loads of uh, vaccines around being trialed but they're not working there's no success with the vaccines uh, currently there is uh, two vaccines being uh, trialed uh, one has been delayed um, reasons not published probably because it's not working like all the uh, 12 or 15 other uh, other vaccine candidates. Uh, my research, if you're wondering, I'm looking into the difference between those people who are symptomatic with herpes and those people who are asymptomatic with herpes. And I'm finishing off a case control study looking at those differences. Um, there is a difference and I'm not going to tell you now because I need to publish first. Unfortunately, that's uh, that's science. I have to publish first and then I publicize. But it's looking good. If you want to know what those results are and you don't want to miss that episode, subscribe because it helps the channel and then you will be notified of when uh, um, when I do publish. I do these videos relatively regularly about once a month and then uh, as soon as I publish anything I will um, do a YouTube video uh, as well to shout about what's been discovered. Um, but I won't be filling up your inbox with uh, every uh, herpes paper because uh, very rarely is it groundbreaking for uh, patients. Okay uh, here are some of the uh, websites, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in conclusion, mm -hmm. uh, wash your hands correctly, no soaps, uh, you don't want to fracture that skin with a detergent, if you're sexually active, get a sexual health screen, any problems, see a sexual health doctor, or if sexual health doctors like me don't exist in your country, uh, see a genital dermatologist, uh, and, and they can discuss any concerns around herpes with you. You can also uh, comment below, uh, which is probably appropriate below, um, uh, and I'll try and get back to you. Obviously, this is starting to become a busy channel, so I can't get back to everyone, but I've got most of the information up here, uh, which is uh, good information, unlike some of the crap you get on some other YouTube uh, channels I've seen, which is quite frankly wrong. Um, these are some of the great websites. Go to these websites wherever you are in the world to get the latest information. These are pretty good and they cover uh, various countries. And uh, hit that subscribe button uh, and, and like. It really helps support the channel and um, uh, hopefully will help also support uh, herpes research in the future if all goes well. So look after yourself, have great sexual health and see you next episode. Take care. Goodbye.